for those who are visiting, uh, this is week number nine, it's hard to believe it's week number nine already, of our message series in, uh, from the story. And uh, if you're unfamiliar with the story, it's the Bible in one continuing story from Genesis through Revelation in chronological order. And uh, if you don't have a copy of the story and you would like one, there's still a few more copies at the Life Group kiosk in the other room, and I would just encourage you to, to pick one up. As I was looking at this week, the story of Ruth, I couldn't help but think, you know, Ruth is really a love story. I don't know how many of you have read Ruth prior to coming here this morning or maybe looked at the Life Group questions that you got via email this week. If you haven't looked at those or if you haven't read the story of Ruth, I'm going to encourage you to read the story of Ruth. It's only four chapters long, but it's like reading a love story. Now, I don't want to lose the guys this morning and thinking a love story. I know most guys probably are too interested in a love story or some mushy love story. But when I looked at this story this week, I couldn't help but get caught up in it. And I thought, this story really has the makings for a great movie. It really does. It has the, 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 the makings for a great movie. And when I think about great love stories, I don't know, for some reason I had thought about The Bodyguard. I mean, how many of you have seen the movie The Bodyguard, right? Okay, you know, guys aren't really getting too excited about that, but women like The Bodyguard, okay? And then I was thinking about The Sound of Music. Now, who hasn't seen The Sound of Music 35 times, right? But every time I see The Sound of Music, the hills do come alive. And I love it. There's just something about that movie that just sort of captivates or captures you when you see it. I never get tired of watching The Sound of Music. Every Christmas I have to watch The Sound of Music. This week, I, I learned that The Sound of Music is 50 years old. And Julie Andrews hasn't changed a day in her life, right? I mean, it's just a great movie, but every time you watch it, it captivates you. There's just something about that movie that sort of brings you to tears. And there's this suspense, there's this flow that starts from the beginning to the end, and you're always in surprise even though you've seen it so many times. I think that's kind of how it is with Ruth. When you look at the book of Ruth, you see this, uh, the, the whole plot line, the storyline comes right out in the beginning and you just know it's going somewhere. I want to help unpack some of that this morning as together we look at this love story, if you want to call it that. And guys, don't, don't, don't write me off or shut me off yet because I called it a love story because you know what? I think every one of us guys will find ourselves in the story as well. The story is about Ruth, but it's about a lot more than Ruth. It's about God, and it is about surrender, as Don mentioned before, but it's also about a gracious God who loves every one of us, male and female. And it's also a story about a guy who looked out for outsiders. The guy's name was Boaz. Join me in a word of prayer, and then let's look at Ruth this morning. Father God, we want to give you thanks for giving us the opportunity again this morning to open up your word and look at your continuing story, your continuing pursuit and passionate love of redeeming your people and pulling your people back into a relationship with you. Lord, this morning as we look at Ruth, may we look at ourselves and may we find ourselves in the story, both challenged and comforted. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us today. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I want to look at Ruth, and I want to look right at the uh, first chapter, Ruth 1, verses 1 through 5. And if you're looking at the uh, New Living Translation, the title above it says, Elimelech moved his family to Moab. I don't know about that name, Elimelech, to you, but I kind of like that name. Elimelech, 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 Elimelech. Huh? There's just a little ring to that, okay? Remember Elimelech's name. Not maybe an easy name to pronounce, but Elimelech. He's where we start off. It's then, you look at verse 1, and it says, In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. Right there in line 1, you have the setting for where we're going. For those who were here last week, remember when we talked about judges... There was a period of time in Israel for 390 years when the judges ruled. When the judges ruled, God's favor was on the judge and the people, wasn't it? And the minute the judge 
was done ruling, what did the people do? They spiraled backwards into corruption and sin, didn't they? And every time they spiraled back, God punished them. When you look at that first line, when it says, in the days when the judges ruled Israel, there was a famine in the land. One of the ways that God got his people's attention when they were disobedient was to send a famine in the land. Do you see the connection here? Right there in the beginning, you get the context or the connection. The ruling of the judges, the famine, and then we get into the story of this man called Elimelech. It says, so a man from Bethlehem, okay, circle that word Bethlehem, we're going to come back to that, in Judah, left his home and went to the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married, or, yeah, one married a woman named Orpah, and the other a woman named Ruth. But about ten years later, both Malan and Kilian died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. I want you to look at that. Right at the beginning, you see this story of what's happened here, okay? You see this story of so much that's happened, and you can kind of feel it. You kind of feel it where she's lost her son, sons-in-laws. She's lost her husband. You can feel the pain. You can feel the hurt. So much has gone wrong with this lady. It's kind of a tearjerker right from the beginning, right? You don't even have to read the rest of the story and you're already in tears. Now before I go on, I think it's important that you see the family tree or the chart. So I want us to take a look at that. Elimelech and Naomi are the two that leave Bethlehem and are married. They have the two sons, Malon and Kilion. Malon marries Ruth. Kilion marries Orpah. Ten years later, Elimelech is gone. Malon is gone. Kilion is gone. What you have left is Naomi and the two daughter-in-laws, Ruth and Orpah. I think it's also important that you look at the map because it says they left Bethlehem. Now, I don't know if you guys have a pointer there, if you can point to Bethlehem. But if you see the little green spot there, Ephraim, and you come down, you see Benjamin, just right below that. Now, you got Jerusalem and Bethlehem, just up above Judah there. Yeah, a little bit lower, right, in, right there. There you go, there's Bethlehem, okay? They left Bethlehem, and they crossed over, and you see Reuben, then they went down to Moab. They are in a totally different country. They didn't go from Cutlerville to Rockford, okay? They left their native land and went to a country that was very foreign for them. Keep that in your mind as a, as a backdrop. Move on with the story. Naomi decides that with all that's happened, there's no reason to stay in Moab anymore. They've been there. They're there for 10 years. They left because of the famine. They left Jerusalem. They went to Moab. 10 years later, her husband's dead. The son-in-laws are dead. And she realizes there's really no reason to stay here anymore. My family, what I, was, what I came here for is gone. And not only is the famine, or she has plenty of food and more, but she says, I can go back to Bethlehem because the famine that was there is no more. There's no more famine there. I should go back. There's really no reason to stay in Moab. So Naomi packs her bags and she decides to head back to Bethlehem. With her come the two widow daughter-in-laws, Ruth and Orpah. And not too far into the trip, I think by the time they got to the west end of the city, if you will, or maybe the north end of Moab, she decides that, you know what, the two girls really don't need to go with her. She says, I can do this on my own, girls. You just head on back to your land. You stay in the land. Well, you can picture the tearjerker of a movie. There the three of them are. They're weeping and they're wailing and they beg to stay in Naomi says, no, 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 stay here. Just stay here, girls. Don't go with me. 
Jesus, you find a couple of other young men and you remarry. Doesn't sound all bad at that point, does it? And then she says, and this is important, she says, even if I were to stay, if I were to stay here with you, if I didn't go back to Bethlehem, if I were to stay here with you, she says, I can't have kids anymore. I'm too old, she says, and if I could have kids, would it be fair to have you girls wait until they were of age to marry? She's really trying to say, girls, this just makes no sense. I'm older. I need to go back to where I came from, to the land I'm familiar with, and you need to stay here in the land that you're familiar with. Now, pick up the story, starting in verse 14. It says, and again, they wept together. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. We're going to come back to that. You should do the same thing. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. That's important. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I ever allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. So Naomi and Ruth, they head to Bethlehem, right? You can picture the two of them. They crossed over Moab, and they get back to Bethlehem, and they get into town, and everybody knows them. Bethlehem's kind of Smallsville, if you will. And the people say to Naomi, Naomi, is it really you? You've been gone for 10 years. Welcome home. Welcome home, Naomi. We've missed you. Welcome back to the family and the land, the people you know, the people you love, the people who love you. And Naomi says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Ooh. You can just feel the pain, the bitterness. She's upset with God. She left because of a famine. But in the process, she lost her husband and she lost her sons. But there's another problem here. Not just did she lose that, but when she left Bethlehem and when her and Elimelech went to Moab, several things happened. First of all, they stepped out of the will of God. Maybe that's a lesson that I don't have in the end, but you can put in your notes if you want. Don't ever step out of the will of God. They stepped out of the will of God. What do I mean by that? If these were good Israelite people and God was trying to punish the people and the land by way of a famine, and they left the land, they were avoiding God's punishment to bring them back. They ran from God. Do you get what I'm saying? They ran from God who was trying to teach them something. They left, and not only did they leave God and leave his will, but second, they went to an enemy country of Israel. Moab and Israel were enemies. Israel had God Almighty. Moab had Chemosh, the God called Chemosh, a detestable God. Some of you are shaking your head. You're familiar with Chemosh. Chemosh demanded human sacrifices from time to time. If you were to watch the movie of Ruth, and I watched part of it this weekend, I don't know how biblically accurate it is, but it's on YouTube. What would we do without YouTube? I don't think YouTube filmed the movie back then. But what they show is they show Ruth's father giving Ruth to the God of Chemosh. All of a sudden it puts a different perspective on it. The God of Chemosh was a detestable God. People gave their kids to him, and sacrifices were often necessary to, uh, to win his favor, if you will. It was a very pagan country. The Israelites were not to marry Moabites. And what did Naomi and Elimelech's sons do? They married Moab women, didn't they? Not only did they run from God... Not only did they go to a pagan land, but they married foreign women who worshipped 
a pagan god. And I want you to just picture that, if you will. Naomi and Ruth are going back to Bethlehem. And in so many ways, they're not only strangers, they're foreigners. They left everything, and yet they're bitter at God. And Naomi is maybe even embarrassed because all of a sudden her Moabitess daughter-in-law is with her. And for Ruth the Moabitess, honestly, there was nothing to go back to Bethlehem for. For her, she hadn't been there. She has no social status there. She has no protection there. She has all new customs to deal with, a new land to deal with, a new religion to deal with. It's nothing but hardship and homesickness. Can you spell messy? If you put yourself in her shoes, if somebody said to you, I want you to leave here today and go to Pakistan with your mother-in-law, how many of you would sign up? Let's pack our bags and go to Pakistan with mother-in-law in a land where you probably know nothing about it. You're going to look very different. You're going to be maybe one of the only people that has American-looking clothes on versus gowns and headgear and all kinds of things, right? You're going to stand out like a sore thumb. You get a picture of what they were walking back into. It's messy. Messy and totally uncomfortable. But there's more. They go back to Bethlehem in the harvest season. And I love this. You can just, you can just see God at work here. They go back to Bethlehem in the harvest season, and Ruth recognizes because it's harvest season, hey, this is an opportunity to go make some money. Oh, but wait. There's a problem with that, too. Because she's going to show up in the employment line, and she's not going to look like everybody else. She's going to look a little different. Again, maybe the clothes, maybe the color of her skin. Maybe it's an accent. Maybe it is some type of a headwear that makes her look different. She's a foreigner. She's a foreigner. She doesn't fit there. And she's female, no less. And worse, her husband is dead. She's very, very vulnerable in that culture. There's an upper story here. I'm giving you all the lower story things from our perspective, the way we would see things. I want you to transition a minute. Look at the upper story for how God was putting things in place. Of all of the fields in Bethlehem, Ruth shows up in the field of Boaz didn't just happen by chance. Boaz was a relative of her father-in-law, the man she never knew. The field is owned by Boaz. When Boaz discovers that Ruth is Naomi's daughter-in-law, he invites her to glean and draw water with his people. And he orders the people not to lay a hand on her. This is very countercultural. Matter of fact, he tells his people, find some extra stuff. Guys, cut some extra grains of stock and leave it on the ground for her to pick up. Leave some stuff behind for her to glean. Picture Ruth thinking, what is going on here? This guy invited me to drink and eat with him. He told his people to leave stuff behind. This is Ruth's response. Look at chapter 2, verses 10 and 12. It says, Ruth fell at his feet and thanked him warmly. What have I done to deserve such kindness, she asked. I'm only a foreigner. She admits she's a foreigner. Yes, I know, Boaz replied, but I know everything about, or I know about everything you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I have heard how you left your father and mother and your own land to live here among complete strangers. And then verse 12, and we're going to come back to this in a minute. It says, may the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. I'm going to come back to that verse because that's a key verse in understanding what happens next. A short time later, we're fast forwarding, a short time later, it's lunchtime. And Boaz invites Ruth in to have a meal of bread and wine with his people. In fact, the text says she had more than she could eat. She was full. Then she goes back to the field and he ordered for people to leave the grains behind. So she goes out there and starts picking up the stuff that people left behind. At the end of the day, she heads home with food for Naomi. And Naomi sees what happened. And this is Mara at this point. Okay? I'm going to refer to Naomi as Mara, the bitter one. 
when Ruth comes home with the food at night, the bitter one recognized something was happening here. It's sort of the aha moment when the lights go on, and all of a sudden Naomi starts realizing God is doing something here through this relative. Okay, you with me? The lights are coming on. God is going somewhere with this. And all of a sudden, Mara has a renewed hope, if you will. Ruth, Ruth tells, or Naomi tells Ruth, go home, clean up, put on your Sunday best. Shower first, put on your Sunday best, and put on the Juicy Couture, or whatever it's called. Viva la Juicy. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you maybe think Estee Lauder. Channel 5 or Chanel 5 or whatever it's called. Smell good. Look good. Clean up really good, girl, because things are going to change tonight. Mother-in-law was a pretty sharp person. And she says, and after you've done all that stuff, after you smell pretty, look pretty, you head back over there to Boaz's house. And after you get there, wait till he's finished eating. Never bother a man while he's eating. Don't bother a man while he's eating, okay? That's a lesson you can write down too. But when he's done eating, then wait till he goes to bed. And then slip into his room and uncover his feet and lie down at the foot end of his bed. Now, this isn't going to get as juicy as you think it is, okay? I don't want you to go there. Our American mindset says that's where we're going. But that's not where we're going. That's not what happened there. But she says, you slip in the bedroom, and, and you lay down by his feet and uncover his feet so maybe his toes get a little cold during the night. And he's going to wake up, and he's going to wonder what you're doing there. So number one, if... Ruth is not throwing her, herself at him seductively. That's not what's happening here. Number, what, number two in this is Ruth is taking an incredible risk here at what might happen. I mean, think about if you did that. There's a huge risk, isn't there? I don't want somebody else other than my wife waking up at the foot of my bed. In this day and age, the way we carry guns, you probably end up dead. There's huge risks there. But what Ruth is doing is something very cultural. What happens next is Boab wakes up, his feet are uncovered, and there's a woman at the end of his bed. And he asks the question, now it's probably dark, who are you? Good question to ask. And she says, I am your servant Ruth. And she says, spread the corner of your garment over me since you are my guardian redeemer. If you were to look at those words guardian redeemer in, in a Hebrew text, or if you were to look at it in the King James Version, many of you might be familiar with this, it's called the kinsman redeemer. The kinsman is like the kinfolk. Ah, you're the family redeemer. I'm Ruth, you're part of my family. And spreading the corner of the garment, the word for garment in the word Hebrew means wing. W-I-N-G, wing. Now let's go back to verse 12 and see what it says. It says, may the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come. You, you got that? Maybe you got to go back and think about this one. But may the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. Boaz is her kinsman redeemer. Boaz is part of the family. Boaz is going to reward her for what she's done. There's a family fabric here. Fast forward the story real quick. Ruth marries Boaz. They have a son. They name him Obed, meaning worker. He's going to work the land that is redeemed from the family that the family would have lost. They have a son, Obed. The family name continues. 
Naomi is blessed with a grandson to hold and to cuddle. As for the family redeemer, Boaz exercises his obligation to buy the land not only of Ruth's husband, but of the two boys, or of the brother and the father, Elimelech, as well. He buys the whole kit and caboodle. He buys all of it. One of the lessons that I want you to take with you today out of this love story, if you will, is that, and you have to see this, Boaz is reaching out to an outsider. She was a foreigner. He had all his own people around him, the people he was comfortable with, the people he knew, the people who were like him. But Boaz reached out to the foreigner that was in his presence. Now, why do I say that Boaz reached out to a foreigner? I say Boaz reached out to a foreigner because Boaz knew what it was like to be a foreigner. Boaz knew what it was like to not fit. He knows what it's like to be an outsider. Why do I say that? Let's back up a couple weeks. Remember how I said everything points forward? If you back up a couple weeks ago, we talked about the spies who went into the land, into the promised land to check it out, right? We talked about the spies. That one in Joshua said spies into the land. For those of you who were here that day, what was the name of the person? Well, let's see. What was the occupation of the person that hid the spies? A prostitute. What was her name? Rahab. Who is Boaz's mother? Rahab. Does that make sense? He knows what it's like to not fit in. He knows very well what it's like to not be a part of the norm. Boaz reaches out with exceptional grace to the one who didn't fit, if you will. You see the upper story and the lower story coming together? I want you to listen to a little bit more of the story. Look at Ruth 4, 15 and 16. Back in town after marriage, they have a child, the land. It says, the, woman of the, town said to, the women of the town said to Naomi, praise the Lord who has now provided a redeemer for your family. All of a sudden, these women before this said, hey, Naomi, welcome back. And she said, call me bitter. Call me Mara. I'm bitter. The same people. It says, the women of the town said, praise the Lord who has now provided a redeemer for your family. They had a child. May this child be famous in Israel. I wonder if they knew what they were really saying. When they said, may this child be famous in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age. For he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. The story doesn't end there. Boaz and Ruth's, Ruth's son, whose name was Obed, became the father of Jesse. Jesse became the father of David. And 28 generations later, in Bethlehem, a child was born whose name was Jesus. Yeah. Huh. Isn't that cool? Who would have ever thought 28 generations earlier through prostitutes and spies and people who didn't fit and through the loss of a husband and loss of sons, pagan gods, foreign lands, who would have thought that God could have just pulled that all together and done something amazing? Don't we have an amazing God? Do you see the love story of God who loves his people and sometimes his people think, God left me, I'm bitter, he left me in this mess. Everything's a mess and all is lost. And God is saying, no, it's just part of the plan to bring you back. I love it. It is such a God story. How God brings the upper story and lower story together. And when you look at 28 generations later, it was still a mess. It was a young, pregnant, young lives girl who had a baby. Never had a sexual relationship. Figure that one out. I hope you get this. I hope you get it. 
we got an awesome God who brings triumph out of tragedy. Who brings hope out of hopelessness. Who takes brokenness and turns it into beauty. A God who takes messes and turns them into miracles. A God who brings the upper story and lower story together. In Romans 8 verse 28 it says he works all things. Not just some things, but all things for the good of those who love him. Maybe I need to say, do you love him? If you love him, he's going to make all things work for the good. He brought the upper story and lower story together. God the Father, Jesus Christ on earth. It's Lent. We're looking at Easter. We're looking at the cross. God sent his son to die. A kinsman redeemer for us. Family, adopted sons and daughters of God. You see that? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have life. And not just life now, but life to the fullest. A kinsman redeemer. For those who believe, we're family of God. We have a God who redeemed us from this life. He promises us this life is nothing like the life that's yet to come. We have hope. I know we look at our calendars, we look at the crises in our life, and it's easy to say we're doomed. But we've got hope. But where are you? Where am I? Where are we really? Let's bring this thing home. Maybe your life seems hopeless. Maybe you taste the bitterness. Maybe your name is Mara. Crisis after crisis after crisis. You get out of one and you're right into another. Maybe you're a young person and you feel like the foreigner in your school. Or you don't fit. You just don't fit. Maybe you're struggling academically. Academically, I can't even say academically. Academically, okay? I know I struggled. You guys know the story. I wasn't the sharpest pencil in the drawer. I don't think my pencil even had lead in it half the time. I didn't care. I made the top 98% of the class possible. They should thank me. They should thank me. God does some pretty crazy stuff with ordinary people. God takes messes, like I said, and turns them into miracles. Maybe you're a, kid, a young person. You don't, you don't feel good. You don't feel like you fit. Maybe you're a couple and you're struggling in marriage. I, I know that's here. There are no perfect marriages. People always talk about marriages made in heaven. Well, yeah, thunder and lightning come from heaven too. Some of you know that storm. Yeah, the perfect storm, huh? At home sometimes, right? But you're struggling and you wonder, where is this going? I know what that's like to stand at the top of the steps and say, are we over? Because I've been there. We have a God who can put things back together. Maybe you're single. And you're wondering, God, what is God's plan for me? Does he have a mate for me in life? Or maybe you were married, now you're alone. What's the rest of your life going to look like? You wonder what God's plan is? Or maybe you're a parent, or a, a couple rather, and maybe you've lost a child, and maybe you never had a child, and you're trying to have children. And you just wonder, what is God doing? What is God saying to us? Maybe you have a famine in your land. Your land, your household. Don't run from it. Stay in the will of God. Just wait on God. I've been at the hospital way too many times in the past couple of weeks for surgeries and everything else. And the one text I always read is Psalm 37. I should say always, but quite often I read. Because when you look at Psalm 37, there's four commands in there. But that fourth command in Psalm 37 is just be still and know that I'm God. That's hard, isn't it? It's hard because we want to make things happen. And sometimes when we run ahead, we make messes. But to be still. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's an addiction that you've hid so well. I, I don't know. 
Maybe you're alone in the crowd, okay? Maybe you're the foreigner. I want you to know this, and you can write this down. God loves you. You need to hear that. Maybe you don't hear that from your mate as much as you should. Maybe you haven't heard it from anybody in a long time. God loves you. Hear it from your pastor this morning. God loves you. There's nothing you can do that will make him love you less. Nothing you can do that will make him love you more. He loves you just the way you are. But he doesn't want to leave you. He doesn't want to leave you where you're at. He's got better plans. Bring the upper and the lower together. Maybe things are going well. I'm going to challenge you to do three things if things are going well. The first thing is identify the one. It doesn't matter. I should say, let me rephrase that even now that I'm thinking about it. It doesn't matter if you're doing well or not doing as well. Identify somebody. Identify the one. Identify the foreigner, the one who doesn't fit. Identify that person. Who is it? We all have them. The one that we know is alone in the crowd. And then second is commit to making a difference in that person's life. Identify them and then commit to making a difference. Do for the one what you'd like to do for everyone. You can't do everything for everybody. I can't either. But if I can just do for the one that I'd like to do for everyone, we have the ability to change the direction of many people's lives. Commit to making a difference. Invest in the young person that's struggling. Maybe that's part of what the Orange Program is about. Invest in a couple that's newly married. Invest in a couple that's older or younger than you. If you're older than them, that's what I love about life groups. Young couples, older couples, and the mix and how they lean into each other. That's be in the church. Volunteer as a mentor at Young Lives. Take the mission trip to Corinto. It'll change your life for the rest of your life. Step in and help the one that's alone, the widow, the single. Honestly, there's opportunities all around us. Just commit to making a difference. And then the third thing I want to see is first is make, identify the one. Second is commit to making a difference. And third, recognize how God uses little decisions to carry out big plans. What if Ruth would have said, you're right, Mom. I'm just going to stay back and mow it. Huh? 28 generations later? It was a decision of surrender that she made. What if we don't surrender? What if we say, I can't possibly make a difference. God isn't going to use me. Let me tell you, if God can use the prostitute Rahab to bring about the baby Jesus, I think there's hope for you and I. And not only hope for you and I, but I think he'll use our story in a powerful way to make a difference in someone else's life. And the reason I say this is because I don't like to take advice from somebody when I'm struggling if they haven't been where I'm at. But if somebody's dealt with something that I'm dealing with, there's credibility and power in their story, isn't there? I don't like to take marriage advice from somebody who's been married five times. Does that make sense? They probably have a lot to teach or a lot of stories. I'm not trying to be unkind with that, but you get what I'm saying. If somebody's walked the path and has credibility, there's power in their story. Don't underestimate the power of your story. Hiding some spies. What a story. I said this is a love story. Maybe we should have the orchestra playing. All you need is love. Dun, 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 dun. You know what? I think some of the greatest love stories haven't been told yet. They need to be lived out. Some of the greatest love stories have to be lived out. I guess the question that I have for you today is, where is God calling you to live out a love story? How can you love someone and show up in a way that you think least likely you're going to impact them, but you will make a huge difference when you step in?
That's really your challenge. It's our challenge, isn't it, when I look at the vision? I don't think you're here this morning by chance. You're here for a reason. If God didn't want you here, you wouldn't be here. I wonder why he didn't want some other people here this morning. Because they should be here to hear this. You need to tell them that. Okay? But when I look at why God has us here, you know why God has us here? Because that vision comes straight out of his word. If we ever fail to accept each other, to love each other, and encourage each other, we have missed the reason God put us together as a church family. The greatest love stories are lived out when we live out the vision. Your challenge is simply to love like you've never loved before. Make a difference to the one that you would like to do for everyone. Never underestimate the power that, and the tools that are within your hands. Your story is a powerful story. And just believe that somehow God is going to bring the upper story and the lower story together when we just move forward in his grace and trust in his plan. Just like Naomi did. Just like Boaz did. God makes miracles out of things that we could never understand. I leave you with this text, not from Ruth, but from Paul. It's to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. Let's stand for a parting blessing and a prayer. Father God, we just thank you for your word to us again this morning. Lord, I pray that each of us may have been touched, that we see ourselves in the story. Sometimes we wonder what on earth you are doing. Lord, may we not so much look for answers as to what you are doing, but that we might just cooperate with you and realize that you are taking your upper story and bringing our lower story together to make them fit, that all things work for the good of those who love you. Lord, give us the grace and peace to wait on you. Give us strength for that journey. Father, we ask it in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Go in the grace of God.